when I see the beauty of the flower, the beauty of the birds, the beauty of manifestation. We live in a really beautiful world. And when you see the kind of care and detail that goes into making the least thing, that the hand that has sculpted that, look at the care and the beauty. You see the way the veins of leaves spread out. And you look at each leaf, you look at the texture of the colors, you look, you really see. That's why to see absolute beauty is to see the source of that beauty at the same time. And it rescues you. Welcome back, dear ones. I am loving sharing season eight with you. How is it landing in your ears and in your hearts? Do get in touch and share. It's always so good to hear from you. For me, it's the best thing when podcast listeners become people that I'm in touch with and even better when in real life. I have just got home from a beautiful fire ceremony out in the open skies for Beltane with Jasmine and Tasha, who I met through listening to the podcast. And it's testament to how this podcast really is a community. And it brings people together that now have so many reference points and shared understandings and visions for our future. Beltane marks the beginning of summer in the Northern Hemisphere and the promise of growth and fertility it brings. And so I wish you the most beautiful Beltane and the most profound unfurling into this new season. As we approach the summer solstice, we will have our retreat on the 14th to the 16th of June. It's the weekend just before the solstice on the theme of remembering. It's a very special opportunity to gather in an incredible place for a weekend of ritual, nature, and community. You can find details in the show notes and on allthatweare.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter if you don't get this yet. And then you'll definitely get all the new episodes and events, retreats, and happenings directly in your inbox. We also have Soul Space next week, and the theme is resilience in ongoing challenging situations. Sometimes there are things that we have to hold, show up for, or be present for in our personal lives, and of course on the collective level, that require a certain type of resilience in order to keep alive the grief and the gratitude to stay with it. We will be exploring this with discussion and also intuitive therapy energy work. It's free for members and you're welcome to come just to this event if you are not a member. In the energy work, we will plant seeds of qualities within that you can grow and bloom over the time following our gathering. You can find details for this on our events calendar, the show notes and in our newsletter. This episode was recorded in India at the start of the year when a group of us were in Oroville, India. The group includes everyone you heard in last week's podcast, including Zach Bush, who is mentioned in this conversation, Ruby Reed from Advaya, and it includes Naharika, whose name you hear, who is on a later podcast on intuition and the unseen worlds that we have coming up. As part of this very special pilgrimage, we spent a few days in Oroville, which is where I met Dipti. We actually have a number of episodes from the start of this podcast journey that were recorded in Oroville, including Aralio, Aviram, Amarti, and Manish Jain. Oroville is a very unique and special project. I was last there for the 50th birthday six years ago, and it is somewhere that has a very special place in my heart. In fact, I share my birthday with Oroville. It was quite something to revisit it now, whilst there is so much turmoil, destruction and change. My guest today is Dipti Tawari, who discovered Sri Aurobindo while yet a teenager. It was his evolutionary worldview that organized and formed her subsequent life choices. She moved permanently to Pondicherry in 1975 and soon after to Oroville, the universal township founded by the mother in 1968 as an attempt to materialize 
in a collective human setting, Sri Aurobindo's Integral Yoga. Oroville is a place of research, study, and experimentation, transcending all exclusivities, seeking a higher and truer life. Initially, Dipti immersed herself in various Oroville activities, including the hosting and organizing of national and international seminars. In 1985, she was pulled in to do some teaching at La School, Oroville School for Teens and Young Adults. This school is based upon free progress, an approach which is not governed by habits, conventions, or preconceived ideas, and wants to be guided by the soul. Soon, an exploration of this education, which sought to awaken the deepest dimensions of consciousness, became a wholehearted preoccupation. Today, Dipti sessions on poetry, literature, culture studies, and exploring Sri Aurobindo's philosophy, whether at last school or at Bharat Nivas, are attended by both teenagers and adults. Additionally, Dipti has represented Oroville, speaking of Sri Aurobindo's evolutionary philosophy in seminars and conferences both in India and abroad. For many years, she's explored the meaning and purpose of Oroville and its central symbol through the Matramandir journals. In this episode, entitled Poetry of Souls, we explore the themes of beauty, sovereign education, and conscious community as we speak to the question, how do we learn to live in a state of harmony and action? We hope that this conversation opens up a new way of being, learning, and connecting to others within you. Welcome to All That We Are, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between activism, the sacred, creativity, and regeneration, the spaces where our inner and outer worlds dance. From healing trauma, to nature connection, to new technologies, to ancient wisdom, it's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a more beautiful future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community, or the pressures we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to listen, to ask ourselves the big questions, and to share what we are already doing and envisioning, we create the futures of our wildest dreams. And we begin to embody all that we are, all that we are becoming, and all that is possible. Dipti, it is a great delight to welcome you to all that we are. Thank you for, for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. What are the features of your wildest dreams in, in a kind of bigger, bigger than your life way? I've always seen a kind of a dimension to the earth, which is full of harmony and sweetness and beauty. And this kind of material life that we all inhabit is in some dimensions less real than that. The gap between the dream and the actuality is sometimes very painful. And I never knew how to bridge that gap until I kind of came across some of these evolutionary ideas that brought me to to Pondicherry and Chabindo and Oroville. So that, in some ways, is real. But you know, when you are ground by life sometimes, you find that less real. And that is probably an issue. Because I think hanging on to holding fast to your dreams is very important. It is as real as it should be as real. But sometimes as you get older, you say, oh my God, <laughs> am I going to see it? Am I going to feel it? But it exists, but it doesn't exist necessarily on the material plane is the issue. But we all, in some parts of ourselves, inhabit that dimension. The point is to bring it into manifestation and not at the same time not be impatient about the fact that it takes so long to do it. Why harmony? Because almost all problems of existence are problems of things not meeting 
harmony is when everything finds its right place. And in a sense, we create this meshing of oneness that we are in one dimension. We need to bring it down into manifest planes. And therefore, harmony becomes very, very important. Harmony of thoughts, harmony of emotions. But I would put harmony and beauty very close together. So harmony and beauty of thoughts and emotions and uh, walking together on a, on a pathway that gets created by that harmony and beauty is, is important. Harmony and beauty and sweetness and I don't even dare say love because love manifests in our plane as beauty and harmony and, and uh, a sense of oneness. Love is probably the highest truth of manifestation, but it expresses itself on the material plane through these dimensions. And that's the truth of who we are. It's our soul truth. It's, uh, it's where the oneness exists. And do you believe that we can live in a state of harmony and action? I think it requires a certain amount of commitment and effort and courage also an enduring perseverance, let's say, <laughs> because sometimes you have to cling to it in spite of all circumstances. And uh, But yes, I think it is, it is possible. I mean, each of us doesn't hold on to it sufficiently. And that's the, 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 the ephemerality of human consciousness, that we don't inhabit that solid peace and centeredness. You know, the Indian idea of uh, rasa, taste. Rasa is always a flavor that takes you to beauty and oneness. And if you look at all the highest expressions of the creative arts in India, the hierarchic sense, they have all been aiming at this taste, which is delight, ananda. And uh, Yes, that is our true dimension. We just don't live there all the time. And our, you know, egoism and narrow self-centeredness takes us out of that dimension. So how to hang on to it? It's actually the only wisdom that one can find in life. That at all costs do, the world is a function of our consciousness. So if we can live in that dimension, to see absolute beauty is to see God, to, to see the divine everywhere. And what is the divine? It's our highest conception of that, uh, that sense of oneness. So, yes, it's like a, a tapasya of beauty, a journey towards self-finding. And that's our true self. So somehow that's the certitude I try to hang on to, that whatever the external circumstances, and it's perfectly possible to, I don't inhabit it permanently, but I know it's possible. So that's kind of the aim of existence, to, to inhabit that permanently. What is it that you've experienced in your own life that has shown you how to cultivate these states and, and how to bring yourself back into them? I have noticed that when things are very, very difficult, it empowers the intensity in terms of the search. So perhaps difficulties come for that reason. Because when things are comfortable and easy, it's easy to forget. It's easy to just float along. And that's fine also, because then one is just being. But this uh, seeking and striving towards that greater whole being and wholeness of being comes with intensity of difficulty. So sometimes the most difficult moments are the moments when one really calls for something deeper, truer. And I find that when I'm troubled, to inhabit a dimension where I can see beauty completely rescues me from the, the focus of the difficulty. So it's actually uh, an exercise in stepping away also. And I find 
yes, you step back, you step inside. But when you step back and in, when I see the beauty of the flower, the beauty of the birds, the beauty of manifestation, we live in a really beautiful world. And when you see the kind of care and detail that goes into making the least thing, that the hand that has sculpted that, look at the care and the beauty. You see the way the veins of leaves spread out. And you look at each leaf, you look at the texture of the colors, you look, you really see. And I, that's why to see absolute beauty is to see the source of that beauty at the same time. And it rescues you. Beauty is, it's our refuge, it's our yes, home, absolutely. it's our heart. It's yeah. everything. It's the divine in manifestation, however we want to describe the source of this creation. Now yeah, we have to all become lovers of beauty and to seek beauty in everything, even in the ugliness somehow. It's always there. Yeah. It's always there. Yes. It's just it's just fine tuning. Exactly. Our sight. Unveiling yeah. you know, those layers that block you. Yeah, so I could say I've been in pursuit of that all my life. We're accompanied here by the drumbeat of construction. <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting, which keeps you in matter. Yeah. Do not forget that you are material beings in material bodies, and that reminds us. Absolutely. Reminds us as well that things are always in motion, evolving. Yes, yes, yes. Creation is always happening. We are living in a very interesting moment. When you think of, uh, we've never had so many uh, beings on Earth. So, if you if you imagine a kind of an evolutionary perspective that uh, everything that is a complex manifestation has more of a spark of something in it, the complexity creates. Uh, a kind of a wideness of the spark. A simple thing can be very, very deep. But when you think of all that, there's a tremendous possibility right now that we inhabit in this world. It's so ludicrous on one plane that we use our intelligence in the way we use it. And at the same time, just a little switch and we could be on the other side. And we could make everyone safe and comfortable on this earth. So why don't we? And um, if I ever have a strong emotion, it is towards that. What is wrong with us? Why don't we do what we are supposed to be doing? So that's the human condition. And we as, as humans, in, in a more collective sense of that word, uh, tend to stray really quite far. <laughs> that's true. From what we're talking about. Yeah. What is it that you feel drives that disconnection? It's this, you know, you have this little self and the little self is governed by small emotions, you know, the little angers and the jealousies and the, I mean, uh, literature is full of illustrations of the, I mean, Shakespeare manages to give you all the like archetypes of you you go down the dimension of jealousy or you go down the dimension you have an Othello or a Macbeth or a, you have all these characters that are archetypes of what happens when you inhabit that consciousness and actually in the Indian languages we say anger came into me gussa aya which is interesting because it's not as if it comes from you it comes into you. So the language itself gives you the possibility to say, I am not the anger. The anger has come into me. Therefore, I can refuse it. I am not the jealousy. I am not the envy. I am not the greed. Not to say that I am that. And I think some religions make the error of saying, you are whatever, a sinner or somebody. No, you're not. You are a divine being embodied in a material body. What dies is the body. But you, you are an immortal soul. And these things don't have to attach. The soul is free of all this. 
It doesn't have to be in that. So I think if we could go out of the little self and inhabit that great selfhood that we share with everybody else and also the universe, it's just a kind of a switching of the needle, the compass needle towards the truth of our being. And I guess that is the tapasya we have to do beyond all philosophies and religions and everything, it's actually a very simple thing we have to do. To say, I'm that. I don't have to be this. I don't have to be small and little and mean. And, and if we all, and we have the capacity, because, you know, even the, the most impossible character on earth has that dimension. You can touch that dimension. When you really reach somebody, you find that dimension. You find this beautiful spark that is growing inside that person. I mean, it is true that modern life is organized to keep your eyes turned outwards. So what we say, Bahiri Mukhai, we look outwards. We need to look inside because all the solutions are within us. And if we turned all those energies that spend so much of time running all over the world achieving what? I don't know, because when you think of the ephemerality of human life, it goes away so fast. You, you are young for a very short time, and before you know it, your body has aged. It's so transient. Why do we run after things that are transient along with the transients? We could easily hang on to the thing that survives and lasts, and that is that, that dimension. So it's like we are confronting in today's world, which seems to be expressing so much of the opposite of what it should express. Today we have all the knowledge we need to turn the earth into a beautiful garden at the service of the highest truth, whatever we conceive that highest truth to be, that's secondary, because minds make conceptions. But if we all pursue truth as we conceive it, but the highest truth, the highest perfection, the highest beauty, the highest sweetness, however each of us wants to define it, we could turn this earth into what it should be, this small, blue, beautiful island floating in the immensity of space, because there it doesn't seem to be another one like that. Wherever we look into space, this one, this little blue earth stands out and she's precious and she needs to be protected. And we should all be trustees of that protection. So each of us finds our own way. We here in the domain I inhabit, I've been trying to do it. We don't succeed very well. We often seem to be doing the exact opposite of what we should be doing. But still, the intentionality is very important. And then the power and the energy we put towards that intentionality is, is also equally important. Do you have a sense around like why that happens? Because what, what you're saying of, of how you know, the intention is often there and then the opposite unfolds, especially in communities and, and in all communities. It's happened in every single group and community that I've ever been a part of, where you create a kind of a resonant field and you create structures to hold everything. And yet, mm. and yet. <laughs> yeah, the opposite energies come in. Yeah. No. It's interesting because it cannot be an idea in the head. We can start, we do start, because we are thinking beings. The human being is, a, is the one who thinks. We actually are the only ones who can stop and reflect and, and respond to nature in a way that nobody is. I mean, I cannot imagine a tiger stopping and appreciating the beauty of a flower. Well, maybe the tiger does, but it doesn't seem to be that obvious. We are the ones who stop and seek things, but we think things and you cannot think this. 
you have to live it, you embody it. And in the life energy are all those characters, mm. Mr. Jealousy and anger and greed and, you know, what in the religions are called the deadly sins, what is called in the, in the Sanskrit idea, it's called the intrinsic qualities of material existence, which is why most spiritual disciplines have said, abandon this. This is hopeless. Mithya maya, anithya masukam lokam. Even the Gita says that. I don't find that satisfactory. It has never answered to me that why in the world would we create this manifestation if the purpose is to wake up and leave? Not satisfactory. So I find it so interesting to have a reverse perspective, to, to say, okay, the problem is lack of harmony. The problem is because there is no meeting, we've got to harmonize these negativities. We have to put them in their right place. So this vitality that surges out in an egoistic manner, it can equally surge out in a manner of self-giving. And sometimes in the same individual, the two energies coexist. You can suddenly be the most generous self-giving self. And we do that, you know, when we love, when we genuinely love people, that love transcends the difficulty. You know, sometimes you cannot stand your family. You don't get along, but there is a level of connection and trust. So we have to create that sense of family with everybody. And actually, the Indian tradition has argued that Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the whole world is one family. It's a spiritual truth, but it isn't a truth of life. It isn't a truth we live. And yet we can live it. But you cannot just live it by saying, I'm going to live it. You have to work at it. You have to work every second of the day, every day of your life. It should be the main focus of your life. Everything else is a means to do it. But the thing to do is to arrive at that oneness. I think that's enough to, it's a siren song that takes away everything else you might want to do. And it's a life's work. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you may not achieve it in a single lifetime, yeah. but it's a journey that continues. So the Indian idea that punarapi janamam, punarapi maranam, you're born again and again and you die, and it makes sense because you don't have to believe in rebirth. The world is not explicable if there is no pattern of returning. And so the more you can develop in terms of consciousness, the more you can bring back to your next lifetime. So nothing is lost. Everything you achieve in a single lifetime, you carry over into the next and you can start from there. Now, one part of me gets very irritated with that idea because it takes you 18 years to wake up to meaning and purpose. I mean, on an average, you begin to ask such questions. Luckily for me, I started asking them much, much earlier. And some kids, if they remain intact, they never stop. So like... actually, I was going to say that. Yeah. Acceleration would mean creating life conditions where children inhabit that dimension. They never lose it. They begin to find meaning and purpose from childhood. Can you imagine what interesting kids we would, now we squash the truth of that child. We, he has to, she has to fit into society. You begin to fake it. You begin to pretend. You begin to lie about who you truly are. Now we need to create a society that doesn't, doesn't allow that to happen. That allows these souls to be effulgent materially present. So education is super important. Education should not be for success and for career and money. Education should be to find the secrets of the universe and secrets of yourself. That's the true purpose. So these are things we could do tomorrow. And I think they're being done. They're being done in pockets all over the world. Now what we need to do is multiply within a concentrated space and time. And create a sort of a, a critical mass that reverses. There are more people working and living like this than in the pursuit of a blind pursuit of just self-aggrandizing. 
self-development. So we are at a key moment. And even though things great, things grind sometimes, I'm hoping we will succeed. What does it mean to succeed? Succeed in the sense you materially see the, the dimensions of harmony. I mean, why are there still wars? Compl a war, there are no victors in a war. War is misfortune for everybody. The moment you go to war, you've lost. Both sides have lost. Who is victorious in a war? And what do you get? A Pyrrhic victory. So why should we, in this century, 2024, have wars? There's a, a very strong, knotted, concentrated, and I think it's not the majority on earth, a kind of a perverse will that seems to be pushing us into these dimensions. And wherever there is breakdown and disagreement, it's always now a minority that's controlling everybody. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating how on a community level, like one person or two people can like, like create a whole ripple through the whole absolutely. field of the whole group or the whole community based on what's moving through them or what it is that they want. And as we see with all of the conflicts that are in the world currently, that it's a, the system that is upholding that is a system that most people don't feel connected to. And it's not what most people want. And it's in spite of them most of the time. Yeah. It's kind of imposing itself on ordinary people. So this is their red evening. I am sure that it's not, they're not standing on the, on the head of a new day. They're standing in their red evening. It will. It's kind of a dying explosion that's taking place. And maybe it's a fairy tale, I tell myself, but I'd rather live in that fairy tale. But it feels, from what you're sharing, like what I can really feel in my body is that the invitation is to, well, to, to not be one of those people. I agree. <laughs> and to, to find a way of, really being very connected to the way that we show up in our lives and that we show up in a group and that we show up in community and we show up in the world. And which isn't to say that we won't make mistakes or that we won't be moved by things because, you know, as you said, the anger, it comes into us, the grief, not the grief. I, I feel like anger is different to greed and, and those kind of things. Like, anger, sadness, grief, like it's energy that just needs to move through people. But we can also be careful not to throw that at others when it's moving through us, but to recognize that that is also part of the transmutation process that we can, we can move it through and find ways of, of showing up in spaces that mean that we're creating safety in yeah. that space and we're creating those fields of trust and those fields of beauty and that the more of us that do that then the more that that can hold a field where it becomes harder for those other energies to have that space and I also realized that what I've just said is quite naive in terms of the context of when you're actually in a community or when a country is being bombed because it has oil and it's that <laughs> simple <laughs> and yeah. and so on this very like micro level of what we can do in our own lives it's it is to embody what can be possible and to not be pulled into things constantly so that we remain in that space of of sovereignty and connected Absolutely. to the beauty now the point you made about not being one of those people, everyone who's on earth today, whether they make a change that's visible or not, have to choose inwardly because we are constantly confronted with choices. 
constantly. At every moment, there's a choice to be made. And if we could make consciously choices that turn towards beauty and harmony, what you're saying about grief, it's almost a power of the darkness because it takes away all your vitality and energy grief. It reduces you into something small and takes away your confidence, takes away your trust in what you're doing in yourself. So that's the power of the action of the, the, the energies of the dark. And so at all cost, we have to be voluntarily optimistic that the light always wins. And I find that interesting because, you know, when you look at nature, we create such destruction in nature. But you leave it be, and immediately she's there, and she's blooming, and she's occupying all these broken spaces, and she comes back. So she is our material mother, nature. And I feel this material mother, that is nature, exists on each dimension the mother of that dimension. So I trust this energy and force. And I trust that if we can just give ourselves to it, it will direct us, use us, find a way for us to lend ourselves to that which builds rather than that which is dying and going out of existence, even though it seems to be dominant. And so we have to be optimistic. We have to be trusting that Earth doesn't get destroyed, that humanity will evolve beyond this, this destructive phase, this pygmy mentality. And I don't mean people have that pygmy mentality, but the dominant powers do. Mm. What's the pygmy mentality? It's like you don't have that wideness and openness that consciousness should bring. It's a limited consciousness. It's a consciousness that is just obsessed with itself. Where does that word come from? A pygmy is something that's not fully developed, but I'm using it metaphorically. A mentality that's not grown into the wideness and the... Because a truly developed mind is always open, hasn't decided receives the circumstances of the moment and responds to them in that moment. You cannot have preconceived ideas because everything is always different. Life always gives you something new. The past is the past. So you have to have an openness towards the future and an open mind, a mind that's not closed, a mind that's expanding and widening is the best kind of mind at the service of life. And then a life has to be open-hearted, generous, self-giving. I mean, we know it all. As a species, we've understood what is needed. We're just not living it and doing it is all. And we say it is all, but the consequences are quite huge at this point. Exactly. So I, I actually, when I'm in trouble with my thought, I turn to poetry. And, you know, we've turned poetry into something that's just added on. And yet poetry embodies sometimes the, the best ideas that you can imagine. I don't know if you've um, read this poem of Walt Whitman. He, he writes it at the time when the Suez Canal is just opening and it's called Passage to India. And I, I've often spoken to people from the United States and I've said, have you read this poem? And often they don't read it. So it's one of the poems that is not so focused. And in that he says, it was always the intention that there has been something transcendent that has always had the intention to reduce the earth into a little village where you know, even the opening of the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, and the laying of the transatlantic cable, the, the railway across the United States, all of these things began to shrink us into a kind of a single entity. And he says the intention has always been to find the soul. And that from the beginning, this has been the intention. Well, if this was the intention 150 years ago, 
it's now fulfilled that intention. Now we are facing some of the negative issues of that, whereas it should only be positive because that has been the intention to bring us into being one people. All sentient beings are the same expression of that divine spark that started the and so he ends this poem, O oh, my brave soul, O oh, father, father, sail, are not they all the seas of God? And for me, I find poetry so uplifting and inspiring because it can speak to you truth of manifestation, not in a prescriptive manner that you should do this and you should do this, but just as something that vibrates and resonates and changes the structure of your emotions and your thoughts and your feelings. So poetry is my go-to solution for difficulty. You can feel as you're speaking, like I can feel that energy of, of the way in which words and energies can speak to us yes. and reform us. Absolutely. And the Upanishad says, it's a delight. It's a delight that's created the world. And we are just forms and manifestations of that delight. And so when you touch delight, you touch yourself, Ananda. So everything is vibrating, pulsating with that energy of delight. And so I'm constantly trying to nudge myself back into that dimension. Oh, it's the hardest thing on earth to remain in that dimension and remain in a physical body into this, you know, the body that ages and dies at some point in time. But so I am not my body, but I mean, I value this body because it's the, the Indian idea is shariram khalu dharma sadhanam. When you are in the body, you can develop. So the body is the key to how to create the beautiful body of the earth, the earth body. Thank you for tuning in. If you are enjoying this episode, do join our membership. For a small contribution, you can be part of our community where we deepen the conversation and offer spaces of learning and embodiment. As a member, you are a patron supporting the making of this show, keeping the episodes full length, free and accessible for all. And you receive a number of benefits such as monthly soul space, going deeper sessions, access to our library of workshops and discounts on all our online and in-person experiences. Our membership is what makes us able to make this show and stay advertising free in a world that is always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. Head to allthatweare.org forward slash membership to find out more and join today. What is the role of education in all of this? I know that your life has been dedicated to holding spaces of education and alternative ways of education. In the final analysis, you realize that the child is not an empty vessel. The child is a, the child, the teenager, whoever you're dealing with, because I work both with uh, growing kids and also with adults. And all of us are the same. We are, we are growing into deeper dimensionalities, but everybody is a complete being. And what you have to do is evoke what is within. You don't have to put anything in there. So with each person, there is a different pathway. So what you do is you create a kind of a movable feast where everyone can take what they need out of that and grow with it. But the point is we need to be a fullness growing into fullness. And they're not empty. Whoever one works with, we have to recognize that they're a fullness in themselves. When fullness meets fullness, the result is fullness. And then I think intensity helps, focus helps, developing an eye for beauty helps. So different subjects, you know, philosophy awakens the capacity for essential thought. What is essential, you know? 
It answers the why questions. Poetry, art, music creates that dimension of art and the imagination, vision, dreaming. Science creates the capacity for analysis, scientific analysis, looking at a thing and breaking it down into its parts, recognizing that it's a whole. So I think all the subjects are very, very interesting because they awaken a different part of our compl complex being. But in the end, they're only a means towards that, that soul center. So at least the way we try to work in Auroville is to be much more the observer and the listener and receive the impulses that come from the people we are sitting with, child or adult, and together we grow, we touch a dimension. And then it's interesting, then it's really wonderful. So you want to keep touching that, that dimension of truth where there is integrity, there is sincerity, there is no fakery, because a lot of the modern education systems encourage you to pretend, to imitate, to fake it, to make it. And often when you're aiming towards just success, to be successful, sometimes you have to be pretending. To have a career, you sometimes abandon who you truly are. And to make money, actually, if you develop yourself, money will come to you. It's an energy, it's a force. It likes beings of light and consciousness. So for me, everybody is a being of light. It's just sometimes we are obscured, we ourselves are obscured. And so somehow education should be a process of unveiling together our lights. Again, it sounds very abstract, but... It's beautiful. It's kind of an attitude with which you attend to whatever you're supposed to do. And how has your experience been of this in action and the last school and this concept of it's the last school? Because... I could say straight away, I don't follow a syllabus. I create a program of learning and it's intense along with the group of youngsters I'm working with. We decide together. So tell us a little bit about the concept of the last school for those that, that aren't familiar. So we call ourselves a free progress school. And free progress, if you want a definition, is an education that's guided by the deepest dimension, the soul dimension. But it's not subject to habits, to conventions, and to preconceived ideas. So we take away the syllabus that might exist anywhere in the world. We take away certification, because these are all conventions. And we try to approach the thing freshly. So what I would do if I have a group of kids and I say, okay, what are you interested in learning? They come to me because they're going to be doing language, literature, poetry, cultural studies, history, philosophy. We want to do philosophy with you. Okay, what do you want to do in philosophy? Do you have a question? So perhaps that one child has experienced something. What is death? And I tell everybody, should we explore that? And everyone wants to do that. So we'll spend the next few, whatever, months exploring what is death. And one of the first things I would say is, it's something you should never be afraid of. It's the one inevitable truth of being in a body. So let's look at it. So we look at it scientifically, we look at it culturally, we look at it poetically, we look, we'll actually go and see somebody who passed away. We're gonna watch the process of cremation or burial. So we look at it on many dimensions. At the end of it, the kids have a kind of a fullness of connection with that truth of life, just as an example. And I think it's a very, very important truth that kids should know, just as they need to know about life. You know, city kids don't even know where milk comes from. Our kids in Oroville grow up with everything. They can deal with a snake. If there's a snake in the house, they can deal with it. They know how to deal with nature. They know what nature throws at them. They can always address it and deal with it. So life itself is our field of learning, but 
an intellectual understanding of life can come through the study of the sciences, can come through the study of literature, of history, of... And again, when we look at a place like Oroville, which is a universal collectivity, history can't be taught from a national perspective. It has to be taught from a human perspective. So what we do is we look at the world and we look at luminous periods. If you look at the world historically, there always, there's always a period which has got a shining light. The Renaissance in Italy, our oh, Athenian Greece. Now, of course, history cleans up all the negativity and what remains is all the positive aspects. So we look at that. We look at the golden age of Islam, for instance. We look, And in the process, we are looking at things that may be an issue today. But you get a perspective from the past to the present. And then maybe the question arises, what happened? When did it go wrong? Why did it go wrong? So then we look at why. What happened? How did it take that road? And where is that road leading to? So you end up with fundamental questions that develop your capacity for discrimination, for discernment, and finally and only, most importantly, synthesis. That you've got to harmonize the opposites, because if you want to be in pursuit of beauty, you've got to take the opposites and harmonize them. So in a sense, um, we are aiming at a wholeness through whichever subject, and we have all the subjects. And through that subject, uh, when we do, for instance, uh, uh, a week of creative art, all the teachers become students. So suddenly the message goes to the kids that it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you're always a learner. Yeah. Oroville is supposed to be a learning society where everyone's a student. And as quickly as possible, if a child is really good at something, you say, why don't you teach it? You know, so-and-so is not so good. So that empowers somebody who's able to do something, you teach one, you teach somebody else. And when you're teaching, you're giving yourself, not just teaching. So you learn the dimension of giving. You learn the dimension of receiving. So in the end, it's these profound, even spiritual qualities that need to be awakened through life and action. So our processes are more organic, but they're very structured. Punctuality, regularity, commitment. Those are qualities that are not rules. We have no rules. But hey, listen, you can't survive here if you're not punctual and committed. We can only work together if you're committed. So then you engage. It's not I am doing something with you. It's together we are seeking some answers. And so from the very beginning, the students and the teachers are in a choice together. In some ways, that day when I spoke to you two, three days ago, the reason why I asked you all to speak was because not only do you speak, I see you, I hear you. I don't know what I would absorb in that, that one sentence or two, but something I get. Everyone's voice is there. And that creates a different dimension to the room rather than just, you know, parachuting in and doing your blah, blah and going out. They, they, it creates a kind of a, a awakened connection wherever that leads. And there are times where it leads very far. There are times when, you know, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't gel. Maybe we don't meet, which is also a learning experience equally. But it opens up possibility to more presence. Yes. And it frees everyone from being able to speak if they have something to add. Because if they've spoken at the beginning, then they can intervene if they choose to. Often people don't because also people are polite and when someone is speaking, they let them speak, etc. But there can be more room for lateral learning. What have you seen in students from the last school and how they've then moved in the world? I find that I don't just say last school, I would say Oroville youth always find a place in the world because they are based in life much more than in thought. What happens everywhere in the world is you are trained and then you're kind of thrown into the big bad world and you have to start learning again how to adjust to the world. The Oroville kids don't have to do that. They may have to learn academic stuff because they may be a little, not necessarily, because sometimes we are doing stuff that you would do at 
college level or something like that, but uh, they can deal with life. They know how to deal with it. And so they fit in, they manage. I don't, at least in all the years I've been teaching, I have found very exceptionally someone who is completely in trouble. And then that's almost a psychological condition and not anything to do with uh, what was done or given, because they can be kids who are a little bit messed up. But that's almost in spite of everything else that took place. It's just something to be worked out in the nature. And that's true of every environment. Yes, exactly. But that's painful still. I mean, I don't like that kind of a situation. And somehow we should have a healed standard for everybody. But not all the beings who are embodied uh, come into birth in comfortable situations. They have. There's still a lot of suffering that's uh, received and imparted. And not all learning environments, no matter how alternative they are, are right for every yeah. one. The other thing that happens in Oroville is it's a place for transformation, for change. And we never really understand enough that if you look at in uh, nature, the best example for transformation is you take a caterpillar and his life is just to go along the branch, eat, eat eat leaves, eat leaves, and at some point in time it's eaten just enough leaves and it goes into this chrysalis. And then it's in that chrysalis and just when it's ready, not a minute before, it struggles out of that chrysalis and we get a butterfly. If you cut that chrysalis, you get a rotting caterpillar. So what happens when people come to Oroville is they have been somebody or something. They've created a, a persona. It's not the true person, but it's the persona. And they come to Oroville and immediately that persona gets disturbed because there is a force field here that's aimed at change and transmutation. And so how do you change? You have to bring things up. Transformation is disintegration before rebirth. So sometimes if you identify with that which is breaking down, it's painful. If you can identify with this, you know, like a trapeze artist, you're flying through the air with nothing to support you, and you will find something to support you, your, your new self, your true self. You're emerging out of something. You're sloughing off the old skin. So we have all these examples in nature, and, but it's very hard to live it. And it's, you have to live it, you don't think it. So it roils your life energy. Any place on earth which has a strong force field, not just all of it, anywhere where change is demanded. And where there's power spots of, yes. of nature, pyramids or exactly. tours or it springs. Provokes things. It provokes things. So if, if something in you says, all right, that's what I'm going through, you can endure it and you can survive it because you, your eye is fixed on the beyond. But if you completely just lose yourself in the moment, you can panic. And sometimes if you come into these spaces, if you're in a very centered place, you just access absolutely huge absolutely. dimensions of joy and absolutely. bliss and connection. Exactly. Which is what you experienced, no, when you came. Has it been the same experience this time? Yeah, it okay, has. wonderful. On a personal level, oh, absolutely. That's I wonderful. Mean, obviously. That means you're hooked into the deepest truth. Here, it yes. seems. Yeah, that's lucky. <laughs> Not everywhere. There yeah. are other places in the world where I go and I yeah. cry or I go and I feel anger. Or, no, no, that's good. Um, yeah. But here, yeah, I felt like extremely blissful the last few days. Wow. In the present context, <laughs> that's really something. <laughs> that means you're really connected to, because that is the truth of this place. Mm -hmm. That is the truth of this place. I mean, actually, you know, when Naharika wanted me to speak, and I said, right now, I'm not really, you know, in this absolute super confidence about, I'd like to present Oroville at its best. And so I was a bit doubtful. And that's that's the doubt you've been getting from my... <laughs> you sure you want me to speak? I decided a few months ago that in this dimension, if somebody asks me that they want me to do something, I won't say no. So I had decided that. 
And then I'm constantly tempted to say, no, no, are you sure? Do you really want me to speak? Are you sure you are? Even this morning, I had a session with a whole bunch of teachers. And I'm saying, are you sure? So that's why I'm doing mm. this. It's, it's more my problem than anything else. Well, I know that we as a group really enjoyed being with you. And here we are in this space. And I'm really enjoying, and I'm sure everyone listening here is the, the way that you weave wisdom and there's something about these times, like I feel it in myself, where I just want to retreat. And it's not necessarily like retreating from the world, but it's just being a bit quieter and being a bit less front center. And so still very much engaging with life, not going to the mountain. No. But there's something about these times where I want to do it softer, more gently in the day-to-day -day moments of my life and less in a louder, on a stage kind of way. And yet I also feel that when asked, you can't the no. answer is yes, yeah. because you have to trust you have to in, say yes that, to the universe. in that energy that's yes. asking you to do yes. that. No, particularly if you have a good contact. So that day when we met, I mean, we met literally, I, I resonated with all of you and with you and with Zark and everybody. And then I'm saying, oh, Deepti, why are you always second guessing? But <laughs> you know, it, it's always that, 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 you know, the little self that's questioning yeah. everything. You know, the, this chakra, the throat, the throat chakra, the Vishuddha chakra is the one that is the expressive mind, the externalizing mind. Now, a Socrates had that chakra very well developed, but he was not only speaking from the externalizing mind, he was speaking from his inner dimension, which is why we remember him. Voices that survive are because they come from the deepest root. You don't, ha you know, they were teaching in the time of Socrates, they were teaching you sophistry. So you could actually be trained in rhetoric to be able to. So sometimes when one can speak well enough, one can end up becoming rhetorical. And that's dangerous because that feeds the ego. So that is the question I had. That, hmm. You're not always in the best state. Do you really want to speak? Which part of you wants to speak? And so sometimes for me, the measure is the enthusiasm from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one doesn't know how to measure this. I mean, maybe all this is not for the pod. I'm just telling you. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we've entered a slipstream and I'm like, is it for the podcast or not? And, and maybe it is because maybe there's a, a truth in... In that understanding, it's like that, that kind of questioning of, of the, the why and the is this is in integrity and then not needing to always just take up the space because there's space there. But there's something that's different around saying yes and showing up and trusting when you're invited somewhere that you have something to offer into that space. Exactly. And it's quite a different consciousness. And it feels like a shift that has happened that I'm definitely experiencing in myself. And talking about it with you, I feel like maybe it's also a global shift that we're experiencing of coming out of that, like loud to be seen, like that kind of energy into something that is more subtle and grounded and rooted in the heart and allows for what we were talking about earlier on of how do we then be in connection in community in our wider politics in all of it and be part of the shift it is when you're coming from it not from that place of like <gasps> I need this, like I need to be giving the talk or being on the podcast or even hosting the podcast I to agree. just, well, this is because happening. It is enough. <laughs> There's enough wisdom already there in the world. There are enough words already. So I think of a dimension where words are bouncing off each other endlessly. So we need to touch a dimension of words that inhabits silence. I don't know if that paradox works. I feel where you are and, and I also feel that when we get too attached to words of the past, we miss the words of the present. And for me, like coming into a community like this one, where there are two people that are not in their bodies who are quoted endlessly, 
it makes me question what wisdom are we missing from that person that's quoting those people? Yeah. Because there's living wisdom that's alive, that's of this moment, that is maybe influenced by voices of the past, but is equally influenced by energies of the future. And that is in this here moment. And so I believe that is why I do this and why we're here, because that wisdom of this present moment has the power to transform us in a way that wisdom of the past cannot. That's true. But you know, Mother and Shabindo are constantly saying that you don't have to know them. It is a choice of an individual to choose somebody as the master of your yoga or as your guru, as your guide. But actually, there is something happening worldwide. You don't necessarily need to be connected to a particular guide to do that. But the guide can help to align all the confusions that each of us inhabit in different dimensions. As Shakespeare says, there are lessons in stones. So in some ways, if you are completely open and receiving, you will get what you need to get at every moment. It's true. Absolutely. And that wisdom, you know, it may come from reading a book by a great teacher or visiting the ashram that holds the energy of a great teacher. But it also comes in, in the moments of connection in our day-to-day -day life. And it comes in moments of connection to nature as we sit by a tree. And there's a nuance that isn't always embodied of where a guru or a teacher or a community opens that access point of our own divinity, wisdom, intelligence, intuition, empowerment, creativity, courage. And sometimes that attachment can actually shrink all of those qualities within us. That's a journey and many of us listening will have experienced losing ourselves <laughs> <laughs> to a teacher, to a relationship, to a career, to something else. And then having that homecoming experience of coming back into our own divinity and beauty. Yeah, actually, the safest is to give yourself to the vastest, the widest, the truest, whatever is in your understanding, the vastest, the widest, the truest. And you grow through that. And it doesn't matter. We all have to find our own way. What do you feel has influenced you the most or, or that you've understood the most from spending now 50 years, 40 years in Oroville? 48, yeah. 48 years. And getting to live in this wonderful experiment of an international spiritual community. And I know that that question is so huge and it's not really something that you can answer in a few sentences. No, I would but... say I'm on a path. And regardless of where my body was located, that path is, I'm covered into a path. What makes Oroville interesting and impossible is that you have to do it collectively. You have to create a fraternity of collaboration, which means you immediately become dependent on your co-developers of this journey. It's a physical. I think the problem has been to create a collectivity that is concentrated both in time and in place. Because if you look at human history, human aspiration has always been there but it's been individuals, it's been small groups. Now, I think Oroville extends beyond the physicality of this Oroville. There is a global fraternity of seekers, which I'm not aware of, but we're all meshed with each other. We are linked on planes perhaps that we don't consciously inhabit, but we are all calling something of the future down. So I'm part of that journey. You know, when I used to, in the early years when we were driving back from Chennai, and we would come near to Oroville, I would begin to feel the vibration of the place. 
I don't anymore. When I would land back in India, I haven't traveled that much, but if I've ever traveled, it's been to do with Auroville. But when I would land back in India, I would feel the atmosphere of India. Now I don't do that anymore. So I said, what's wrong with me? Have I gone a little grosser? Or do I no longer have the sensitivity? And I think it's because I inhabit a kind of a, a wider dimension where it's become natural, like breathing, that I'm at home anywhere. No, I'm most at home here. So it's, I'm not saying that if you transplanted me to some corner of the world, I would feel as much at home. But I think I'm ho at home in the fraternity of seeking. And so if I could be anywhere that, where we would be aspiring together, I would feel at home. And that's why I don't quite understand this obsession with making the city like tomorrow. I think it's essential to have enough numbers. But I am unable to uh, wrap my head around this idea that if we make a road or if we make something, we're going to get something special down on earth. I think it's a consciousness that we are trying to create. And wherever I'm going to be, I'll be, I'll be part of that seeking for that consciousness, is what I'm saying. And I will be in a kind of a fraternity with all those who have a common aspiration towards something like that, for the earth, for the future, for humanity's evolutionary step. And it doesn't matter where they are located. And what do you see as happening in India at this time? It feels like an incredibly exciting time to be in India. <laughs> I mean, of course, there are, there are political challenges here that we're seeing all over the world, like there's a certain kind of political energy of this time. And we're also seeing that Western power is shifting and India and China like are growing. I would love to hear what you see in all of that. So uh, it seems to me that we are not quite where India is going yet. We are not there yet. But when you are colonized, you can be decolonized physically, but it takes much longer to be decolonized in your emotions and your feelings and your thoughts and your actions. Our education system in India is still based on principles that the British brought into being. Lord Macaulay, he wanted to create servants of the empire and we just can't get rid of some of those things. That So on every level, there is a process of disentangling. So it seems to me that on a psychological level, the India that I see, you know, I, I'm a little bit living in a bubble in Auroville. I'm not quite, Auroville is a little bit its own place. The India I see, when I was living in India 48 years ago, there was half the population. So there is kind of this experience explosion of vitality in India and also an explosion of confidence and also perhaps a self-finding which is more a vitality than a soul truth. So I'm hoping that in another few years we'll inhabit at least what would satisfy me in terms of the dimensionality that I think India and Indians could occupy. But um, I mean, I love India. I come from a family that uh, was engaged, suffered, paid quite a heavy price for the security of India because it's a family that was in the armed forces. People died. My father was a prisoner of war. So I saw the tensions of insecurity that the region that India occupies. And because of my upbringing, I'm very concerned with the very difficult environment that India lives in. There was a dream that Asia and India could be, uh, that China and India could grow together, but they've ended up being in a state of tension. That's not good for the future. For the future, these two Asian giants need to work together. That hasn't happened yet. It is true that Asia is rising and the West is, we've lived in Pax Americana for the last, uh, since the Second World War, and that's waning. 
So we are entering a new world, which is a little bit unclear. But that which I trust, I trust that India will find herself. I trust that the Indian people are sensible enough to grow beyond their passions and find a deeper dimension. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but to arrive at that deepest soul dimension, which comes more naturally to Indian. I speak to somebody from, who's had a very little education and I speak about Maya and Karma and they understand these concepts. So. On an average, Indians may be less materially effective, but spiritually and philosophically, there is a complexity there. And I hope that's the dimension that the world will need in the future. So it doesn't take much to touch that dimension, that soul dimension. Just the colonized mind, once that's yeah. decolonized, the, are, yeah. the soul part is all intact. Yeah, but there's a divorce because we don't trust that. Nothing in your upbringing, in your education gives you that. So it's your emotional dimension. It's what you might get at home. And then it ends up being a bit religious when it's not religious. It should not be religious. It's not the ritual and the performance of whatever. It's what the ritual is supposed to suggest. So somehow there is a journey still to be made. We are in process. That's the best I can say for India. But I'm startled at the energy. If I travel in India, I say, wow. And sometimes it's aggressive also, which I didn't encounter before. Perhaps when the life energy awakens, it comes out in, in this dimension also. And the pot's being stirred yeah. as well. Yeah, so that is startling. Because when I was young, I mean, I was a teenager and I was traveling across from Kashmir to Pondicherry alone. But you were always safe. You may be 18, but you were safe. You could always find someone who would take care of you, who would get you the tea <laughs> from the railway station. And, you know, you felt safe. You felt protected. I traveled alone as a young person much more than I would travel now. But now I don't find it so. We live in a place which is relatively safe. But sometimes in the city, you see a sort of a vibration that I thought, hey, where did that come from? But I think that's part of the whole explosion that's taking place in the world. Everywhere, absolutely. I don't live or travel enough in India to, to give you a lived experience. But I also find really interesting Quests. As I, I joked at that that day with you all in that that for years there were no Indians coming to Oroville. And I was so surprised. Why is nobody else coming to this experiment? And now we are being flooded by young Indians. So something changed. People didn't trust such an experiment when I came. They wanted security and everything. You had to be a bit idiotic to come here. Now it's different. People are ready to risk the lack of security. So something changed. What is the call to action that you would like to leave our friends listening with? We each of us should find ourselves. That's what we come on earth to do. We have a short life to do it in. The measure in which we find our true self, we will find the action that we need to do in the world. It's self-finding that generates action. Everything else is, uh, well, it's what you do. But if you act from the deepest dimension, you can change the structure of the earth. So find yourself. Who are you? Why are you here? What did you come to do? You are an immortal soul. So you came here to do something. Do it. And how would you like our friends listening to connect with you if they would like more time with you? They can come to Oroville. Yes. I'm on email. I can resp I respond to emails. Yes, come to Oroville. See the collectivity that I am one little sapling in. And does the school have a URL that you can share with us here? 
It's called La School at Oroville. We have a website. The Oroville has a oroville.org. There is a website that that will tell you many things. Often the talk, I do give talks every year. There may be at least four or five, but they are not. People tell me, why don't you put it into a something? And I said, no, if people want to land on it, they'll find it. <laughs> I'm not going to organize this because this is not my best dimension. The dimension that I value is the one on the journey. And yes, there are talks that are there, but they're often within the Oroville. Uh, I mean, sometimes when I speak outside of Oroville, then people post that, but I have no uh, no social media presence, no, uh, so I'm just a tiny little person in a tiny little corner of the world. Thank you for landing here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Amisha. Thank you for listening. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode and it has sparked some inspiration and creativity in you. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book and discover so much more over on allthatweare.org. We give space to our guests to share their perspective without debating it or fact-checking, as this approach allows for deep, unedited conversations from the heart. We trust your discernment and wisdom to take what is useful and challenge what isn't in your own understanding. We offer spaces for discussion and integration in our membership community, which we would love for you to join. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, And so it's made possible by you, our beautiful community. If you loved this and would like to connect more deeply with us, please join our membership. You choose what you contribute based on our sliding scale and you become a patron whose support makes this podcast happen as well as receiving access to a library of many resources and invitations to nourishing events. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen so others can find us. This podcast is made by an all-female global team. Me, Amisha Gadiali, producer and host, Anna Greta Folderbach, who crafts the words that accompany each episode, and Mary Chan, who edits the sound so skillfully. All That We Are celebrates all that we are already and the untapped potential that lives inside us. It invites the full power of the more than human world, nature, the unseen, our ancestors and our future generations. It reminds us that we never exist in silo, through borders, timelines or polarity, that in each and every moment, all that we are is here.